So welcome today for best, pra best practices for substance use disorder in youth. And of course, California Bridge is a Department of Public and Health Institute, and we will share this slide deck. Um, you guys know what California Bridge is. We provide 24 seven access to high quality um, treatment and we, our goal is to be an all, all California hospital emergency room um, departments by 2025. Um, are we on our way to our goal? Yes. We're, as of today, we have 276 hospitals and you are here representing one of them. So we're very happy you're on board with us. Um, as you know, our MAT treatment is the new standard of care in emergency departments. And um, if you don't know, well, please reach out to us, mentors at cabridge.org. We have plenty of resources for you to get started. Um, before we have our main speaker, we wanted to make some announcements. Um, for many of you, uh, very are, are very interested in the community healthcare worker certification. We will be having an update at two o'clock today. It is a live Slack chat. I did hijack Chaya's time. Um, we'll put that link um, at for two o'clock. Um, but we felt it was it was a really good time to. We've gotten a lot of questions about this certification, so we wanted to kind of review and give an update of what we know so far. So we hope to see you at two. Um, for some of you may know, CA Bridge is part of a larger bridge. Um, we have grown and expanded into many other um, programs. And one um, program is Access Bridge. Um, and we will be having a webinar about our new reproductive health access. Um, speakers will share newly released algorithms for doctors treating common pregnancy emergencies. So please pass this information on to your ED providers. This is specifically for them, and it's August 8th. And more information is on our training website. So we just want to share and always promote what our bridge team is doing. Our next Navigator Focus series is MAT Update and Overdose Awareness. Um, and we will um, be having that August 24th. And I just wanted to remind you, August 31st um, next month is o uh, International Overdose Awareness Day. So you will be seeing a campaign from us for to promote you to carry to sponsor an event, whether it's a table event, maybe it's an education tra training. This is a really big day for community outreach or for your own hospital outreach. Um, so we're really gonna, you'll see a whole campaign coming up this month of August. These are our objectives today. And so I just wanted to um, really thank and appreciate Dr. Rebecca Trotsy, sir. She is our clinical, um, consultant here at California Bridge. And um, wow, she knows so much about pediatrics and I'm going to let her introduce herself. So Rebecca, I'm going to leave it to you. Hello, 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 everybody. So good to meet you all. I'm here in Los Angeles. I work with the Department of Health Services, which is our county public health care system. Um, we have a bunch of big hospitals. I work in one of the biggest ones. We have a very busy ER. Um, I grew up in Minnesota um, and involved in the juvenile justice system as a renegade youth. So I have much space in my heart for young people. And, um, you know, I have a lot of privilege that helped me overcome what could have been a very tumultuous um, you know, a couple of decades. And I do remember having a juvenile judge say to me, like, I want to give you another chance. And I don't know if he would have given me another chance if I had been a uh, young men of color in LA. So I just want to honor, you know, everybody's coming to this at a different place in their life with a different history. And we're all here to help our communities do as well as they can. I have a couple of slides for you. As always, everybody has a range of learning points and things that they know really well and things that they're struggling to, you know, catch up and implement as quickly as possible. So I'm sure there's questions. Feel free to unmute yourself and give me those questions. I am always feeling humble with Zoom. So hopefully we now see my slides and hopefully we will get them into the right gorgeous. 
um, all in view. I talk to myself and my computer. I hope everybody else does too, because that is how we go. Here we go. You can see my slides, yes? Yes, but it's not in presentation mode. Can you make them bigger? Is this looking better now or is it flopped? It has two slides now. Okay. There we go. Perfect. You got it, girl. Thank you. I am uh, feeling my age these days. Um, so addiction is a treatable condition of pediatric onset. I say that over and over and over again, and that is kind of one of the tracks that I want us all to be able to explain to our communities, our loved ones, um, family members, family members of patients, our doctors that we run into, random people in the elevator. Um, what do you do? I work on addiction and how exciting addiction is a treatable condition of pediatric onset. So young people, pediatric Pediatric patients is where we're gonna see a lot of addiction emerge. And um, we say this over and over again, we can get more and more people into our, our network. Uh, it is interesting that both, we tend to under recognize symptoms in young people and we tend to dismiss it, right? Like, oh, that's just kids being kids, ha ha. Um, it is important for us to take these issues seriously and to love our youth so that they can help de-escalate some of their behaviors and become as healthy as possible as adults. When we go backwards in time and we see our adults showing up in our ER with overdose events, they had many, many opportunities that we could have intervened earlier and we just didn't that would have helped prevent them from kind of going down the track that they're going down. Um, we know, we all know this, we all feel this very experientially that overdose deaths are increasing in our young people, especially here in Southern California, and I think in a lot of our communities um, across California, we're seeing stimulants being mixed with fentanyl intentionally and unintentionally causing overdose deaths. So that's methamphetamines, that's cocaine. Um, pretty much every single family I know has somebody that they know that has overdosed and died on fentanyl or um, you know, they know it's just like either personally one degree or two degrees out that everybody in, in our communities now has this experience. And it disproportionately impacts communities of color and low income communities. Um, and I always want to center that, right? So my experience and my um, ability to network and to connect to my patients is influenced by race and class. And that's why we are so excited and loving that we have amazing wide range of experiences with our navigators and our community members so that we can help translate some of that gaps when it happens. When we see young people in my head, what I'm doing kind of pretty quickly is trying to categorize way, where they are and their use of the drugs. So um, we do see young people with unintentional drug use um, that might mean a very young person, like a five-year-old, you know, seeing something that looks like candy and taking it, right? And that could be unintentional. It could be somebody being slipped something. So I thought I was smoking weed, but I was actually smoking, you know, PCP and weed. I didn't know that. I didn't choose that. It was, you know, unintentionally slipped to me or, you know, something along those lines. It could be coercion and unintentional. So like, I don't want to use the drugs, but my boyfriend, you know, is really pushing me to do it. So that other things can happen. So I think unintentional substance use is happening quite frequently in our young people. And I wanna be able to uncover that and like be able to um, uh, talk about that with them. And also I think there's other kinds of use, right? We have experimental use, social use. Those are the things that we're talking about are in the movies, right? About what young people are doing that, um, you know, I just tried something at a party, but I don't do it often or only I drink when I'm at a party. Those use patterns, um, you know, that's part of human development that we're all experimenting and learning and figuring out what feels good. It can slip into more and more chronic use, dependent use and chaotic use of drugs. It can stay in that social zone. I do caution anybody whose brain is younger than 26 year old. It has um, still growing and learning and everything like that. I mean, I want to say everybody's brain is growing and learning. So um, there is that, but especially young people. So it's important to make sure we're avoiding a lot of toxins for our brain. Um, I have also noticed that people who are in uh, chronic and dependent modes of drug use 
will label themselves or see themselves or talk to me as if they're in experimental or social uses. And it's more um, easy for some people to say, oh, I didn't mean to take this drug, it was unintentional, than perhaps owning kind of their, like, yeah, I actually do cocaine every day and I don't want my parents to know. So it, it does shift. And I know that you guys are good at kind of talking about that. Um, in my community right now, um, and I think in your community right now, when young people are buying drugs on the street that they think is Xanax, that they think is M30s or oxycodone or, or morphine or whatever it is, they more often than not do contain fentanyl. Many of those have a lethal dose of fentanyl in them, which is where we're seeing some of our pediatric overdose deaths. Um, it comes as a surprise because the family's like, we didn't know they used drugs, they're in that experimental zone. Um, and youth themselves see these pills as safe. Um, so I'm kind of jumping ahead light years. We're going into this very other important thing, which is when people have substance use disorder, or I would also encourage people who have recurrent opioid overdose events, that buprenorphine is available, it's a medication, it's safe. I know you guys are experts on this, but sometimes our community members are not. This buprenorphine, she's our queen because she will help protect people's brains against opioid overdose effects um, and save lives. So it can be safely started in any situation, including at home. This is true for youth. All of this is true for young people. You can continue buprenorphine in all settings, including church overnights, including vacations, including other clinics, including hospitals, including you know boarding schools. So it's important for us to make sure that our young people and their families understand that this medication saves lives. This medication needs to continue and stay with this young person throughout their like lovely young life as they go through all their things. And young people can accurately know their bodies, know what opioid withdrawal looks like, it feels like and start that medication at home safely. They can also report accurately those symptoms to a healthcare provider so that we can start medications appropriately at home or in the clinic or in the hospital. And youth can responsibly carry, store, and take their own buprenorphine. So, um, you know, I want to give the young person the tools to take care of themselves and not have a, an adult or some other person say, well, I have to take this from them so that you know, they don't get into trouble, they don't overuse this or misuse it. It's a life-saving, first-line, evidence-based medicine to treat opioid use disorder and prevent opioid overdose deaths. And I say this often, many times in front of parents, in front of judges, in front of whoever's, you know, working with this person, social workers, because you and I, you know, know a lot about buprenorphine, but a lot of our community members don't, and there's a lot of myths around it. And so as much as we can get in front of their heads that buprenorphine is going to be saving their young person's life and its treatment and its science and it's, you know, we're not just making it up, right? And then there's a lot of myths that people carry. So you cannot overdose on buprenorphine. Um, there's been no adolescent deaths caused by buprenorphine. It does not cause people to feel high, to get euphoric, um, doesn't change the mood, so it shouldn't make you feel very depressed. It shouldn't make you very angry, right? It just lets you be your usual self. Um, and I tell people, this is how you feel before you started taking the drugs. That's where we're getting you to, that's your anchor. Um, it can be used with or without any other person's engagement in other programs. So of course I want all my beautiful young people, you know, in family therapy, if that's appropriate, going to school, talking to whoever they wanna to talk to. Um, going to treatment programs, making meetings, whatever it is, I want them to be able to do that. But if they choose that's not them, or if they say yes and then don't show up, buprenorphine needs to continue and they should be able to have access to that medication. So it's very, very, very important that we encourage that young person to take the meds, even if they decide they don't want to talk to social work. Um, and we don't want to have the social worker or whoever kind of using that medication as hostage. Like, well, you can't you know, make this appointment, then you can't get your refills. That's not an appropriate way to address a life-saving treatment. We would never do that for any other medication. Definitely buprenorphine should be continued and restarted in any care setting. So my young people come to me and often I'll see them in the ER, they'll go to their primary care doctor, months will pass, you know, maybe I'll see them again in the ER after another overdose. And what I hear them tell me is, yeah, you started it, I worked, you know, I took it, I took the refills, then I went to my primary care doctor, and then they told me I didn't need it anymore. And often, um, you know, doctors might have a chance to engage with that young person at different points in their life. 
So I see them on their worst day and their primary care doctor sees them on their best day. And you might have like, oh, well, things are fine now. You're, you know, back at school, getting straight A's, all the things. It's important to continue buprenorphine all the time, even when all those great things are happening for a young person's life. The biggest reason young people and old people don't get engaged with life-saving treatment is because they don't feel like they need treatment. They don't feel like they have a problem. And we as a healthcare community haven't been able to understand that that is exactly the kind of patient that we want to work with. That is, if somebody's telling me, no, 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 everything's fine, la, 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 like that's the person that I make sure has buprenorphine in their pocket. Um, there's three ways to treat addiction. You've probably seen this slide before, and I talk to my patients about this. Medication, counseling, support. Support often for young people might be going to a place, a uh, stable housing, where they have a structure, they're waking up at the same time every day, things like that. That's what I mean by support. That's what we call in the community, like a detox or treatment program. Um, those are kind of mythical places, but all they do is kind of give you the same thing every day so that your brain can heal up and you can start making more conscious choices. There's not anything magic about support. Counseling is like, let's talk about how you um, are thinking and feeling so that you can make different choices. You can understand pretty quickly that if you're in chaotic drug use, those two things might not be the right treatment strategy for that person at that time. It turns out for opioid use disorder, it's kind of golden in that the medications and medications alone are gold. All that person needs to do to save their life is put medications in their mouth. Of course, I want them to have these options and to participate as much as they can, but they might only be ready for medications and that is totally fine. Youth under 18 can consent to drug treatment and alcohol treatment and reproductive health care treatment in California. Um, this is state by state, so double check your state, but generally this is what many states um, uh, purport and, and encourage. That said, parents or guardians need to consent in California for the treatment of buprenorphine, also for methadone. There's only like five people under the age of 18 on methadone in California, so we're really talking about buprenorphine. It's okay to emergently start treatment without consent. Let's say you have a withdrawing, overdosing kid in front of you. Of course, you're gonna do something to save their life right now. And you're gonna to try to get in touch with the parent and the guardian to like start making those connections so they understand what's going on. Um, if the parent or guardian is like, F no, we're not gonna do that kind of medication. Of course, we're having conversations to encourage them to come to understand why it's important, um, consider all these other options. and the youth can still consent to um, naltrexone, which is another medication that protects uh, opioid overdose events. It's like a whole day long acting Narcan. Um, that is not as good for many of our patients in terms of like how they're feeling, but it also is an option for them that they can self consent to that they don't need um, their parents' consent. And I just, that's still too long. So my light just turned off. Thank you very much, light. Um, Young people can consent to all of these things if they're considered emancipated or self-sufficient. That is something that is established by a judge. Um, that person that needs to be 15 years and older, living apart from their parents and managing their own finances. Technically, it's regardless of their income sources. They can be doing all sorts of side hustles to manage that income source and be considered emancipated. It is a hard threshold in some counties to meet, so you would want to get in touch with your legal advocates um, about emancipation. Uh, this is how I generally start talking to kids, and I think you guys can teach me about this as well. Um, I'm introducing myself, I'm building rapport, starting low in a neutral conversation, maybe, you know, making a joke in an icebreaker, just like you would at any, like, dinner party, right? I am looking around at the space that I'm in, who else is listening to me, who else is sitting at that bedside, who else is maybe waiting for them to get out of the room and, you know, ask them all about it. And we know we have parents who might be cautious about letting their young person talk to us. So um, I do want to kind of introduce myself to everybody in the room and say, I am very excited to talk to this young person. Um, and I will also talk to you guys in a second. Sometimes we start that conversation together with everybody in the room if it seems like a safe, supportive environment. Sometimes if it seems really fractured, I'm going to ask that family member or friend to step out while I start with the patient. Um, if I'm talking in a group, I'm not asking any kind of um, disclosure information. 
I say, hey, we can talk about all these things. I also want to have a chance to talk to you by myself. That's just something I do with all my patients about all their health things. Um, and you know, then I get into the details in that moment. Um, I ask permission for conversations. Is it okay for us to talk further? I generally lead with the information of why I'm there, right? I am Rebecca. I'm a part of the addiction medicine team here at the hospital. I help patients with pain, with symptoms that are discomfort um, around substance use, could be tobacco, could be other things. Um, and I am here to help connect you to treatment and anything else you might need. So I leave it kind of big, but I start with leading with like how I could help you before I'm starting to ask them information. And then I start asking them the questions that I might want to ask. And I also um, make sure, especially for young people, you know, you can consent to treatment and healthcare services around this issue. If you start sharing with me things that I would be really worried about, like you're going to imminently hurt yourself, imminently hurt somebody else, you have a plan, then we would have to bring somebody else in this conversation. I would want to talk to you about that, but it's important that you know what, you know, what I will keep completely confidential and what we might have to talk about. If we do talk to somebody else about it, I will let you know that that is coming up or that I'm concerned about it so that you can make choices. Um, once I start asking specific questions, my little jam is like I say, I asked all my patients about blah, blah, blah. Has it impacts our community? That way, you know, I think we've all had moments where you're like, why are you asking me that specific question? Is it my face? Is it the color of my skin? Is it that I have a kid? You know, why, you know, so when we're starting to ask more probing questions, make sure we normalize that. Just this is a general part of conversation to help keep you healthy. I ask all my patients this question. I'm not looking at you being like, oh, you're wearing red sneakers. That's why I'm asking you about cocaine, right? Like, no, I just ask everybody about this. Um, Definitely, we're asking questions from that patient way more than we're telling them something. And with young people, sometimes they don't have the opportunity to tell adults to stop often in their life. So there might be a lot of nonverbal cues. So it's like, uh huh, uh huh, nah, 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 right? So um, you can ask them, you know, are you ready? Do you need to take a break? All this stuff. Um, a lot of times, my young people are using emails, texts, and phone to communicate, and that's fine. Um, I think what what has your guys' experience been with young people? Any tips or something that worked really great? Rebecca, I do have a question in the chat about for youth. Um, for the youth you see at 18, are they able to consent for Vivitrol? Yes. Over 12 can consent for Vivitrol. That's now Trexone. So Vivitrol is a brand name of the long-acting monthly injection of Vivitrol. Okay. All right, Joanna, I hope that answered your question. Um, behavioral approaches, these are the other things, the support and the therapy that helps um, patients. The ones I'm working on more often for my patients are motivational interviewing, which is using a set of conversational skills to help people make healthier choices. And contingency management is a system where I'm providing rewards to behaviors that that patient wants to have. So um, they show up and they have a urine toxicology screen that shows that they haven't used any stimulants. Yay, like here's a gift card, like make that an experience for you so that their behavior is able to change. I put those in yellow because those are the ones that work even if somebody is ambivalent, not ready, talking um, uh, with without a lot of agency around changing their behaviors. These other two, cognitive behavior and dialectical behavior, they're gorgeous for when somebody's like, I wanna talk about all the things. Um, I'm gonna kind of jump over the medications for opioid use disorder, but you guys are um, talking to one of the hugest advocates for buprenorphine, and I'm sure you've had a lot of lectures about buprenorphine. One of the things to recognize for young people is it is extremely sad that they are not offered medications for treatment the way we offer to adults and you, very few young people get treatment. Um, there was a study that showed only one in 54 people with opioid use disorder who was young received buprenorphine or medication. And that inequity is even further exacerbated as you would expect with poverty um, and being black and brown. So one of the things that helped uh, me get people to um, put the medication in their mouth, which is what I want. I don't want to just write a prescription and it goes nowhere. I want them to feel comfortable and confident taking that medication is um, understanding what the common concerns about buprenorphine are. 
and being able to like fluently and suavely adjust them. So some things that I hear is, I took buprenorphine before and it made me sick. Okay, um, I usually say something along the lines of, I'm sorry that happened to you, starting too little buprenorphine too soon can make you sick. Would it be okay to try again at a different dose at a different time? And I can help you with some of those symptoms. So that usually helps transform that moment. Um, people saying, well, I heard buprenorphine just for drug addicts. I'm not a drug addict. Could it make me addicted, right? So we say buprenorphine is treatment, helps your brain stabilize so that you can make choices that you wanna make in your life. It doesn't cause harm. Um, the other thing I hear is I wanna get off this medication as soon as possible. I heard withdrawals from it are really difficult. Then that is a, a kind of signal that, you know, they're jumping ahead in the future with anxiety. So, hey, let's work about today. Um, right now, it sounds like you're going through a lot of things. I want to help you get to a place where you're able to, you know, experience all the things you want to experience. And your clinicians and healthcare providers will work with you in the future when you're ready. But let's just talk about today. That's kind of how I focus those conversations. Um, these are the strategies I've also um, had. Like, have you ever tried buprenorphine before? Do you know anybody? Does it work? Um, for them, how does it go? You guys will be a huge part of like making that bridge happen. When I have somebody with opioid overdose who's a young person, I'm of course interested in all these other things that's going on in their life. Are they drinking alcohol? Are they smoking meat? Are they smoking tobacco? Are they using Xanax, meth, cocaine, all the other things, inhalants and hallucinogens. Um, and I'm also like prioritizing the thing that's killing our community. So I wanna know right away about opioids and then I'm kind of backpedaling into all these other things. And you will get to know that young person more over time. And it's okay to leave some of these as like, maybe they do, maybe they don't. I will ask it the next time I see them, right? Um, and of course I want this whole like full hearted relationship with them, what's going on otherwise. And it, it might touch base, have you ever, you know, had a mental health diagnosis? How is it going in school? How is things going at home with family? Do you have safety at home? Kind of, I, I do really tune into that as much as I can. And um, this can be really challenging work for our navigators and our providers. So we are trying to build this world where we have open arms. And sometimes you will have patients who wanna text you at all hours and expect you to reply within five minutes. So having healthy boundaries as a navigator, as like that frontline person in that young person's life is important. So I explain our office hours, like we are here like open like a bank. Um, happy to take your calls then. After hours, leave us a message and we will love, lovingly call you back. We, um, if you text us, if we have an opportunity, we'll text back. We'll definitely text you back within, you know, the day if you're texting at two in the morning. Um, and make sure that you have resources that people can have for um, self-help. And if there is a crisis, where do they go if it's two in the morning and they can't get in touch with you? Um, in our experience here in LA, um, we have some hesitancies that are specific more to young people. And often it seems like the conversation will be like, my biggest issue isn't the drugs, it's my parents, right? Like, so there'll be a flip in that. So you and I as an elder outsider adult would be like, obviously their biggest issue is the drugs right now, but um, the feeling experienced by our patients is not necessarily that. So um, our encouragement often is something like, let's give your mind and body a chance to relax um, and be healthy while you can then focus on whatever that bigger issue is, your boyfriend, your parents. I don't want my parents to know, so great. We talk about confidentiality right up front. Um, I'm gonna quit on my own. Um, I'm just gonna avoid those places where my friends are that I used to use with, so it's not really a problem. Um, we kind of make a bridging statement, like that's great, that's a good strategy, and also success starts with putting medications in mouth so that you can keep those choices um, as you go forward out of the hospital or out of the clinic or out of our community center today. Um, some of the hesitancies, I just call them withdrawal symptoms, like, oh, this nausea is so bad, right? Like, I'm, I'm in so much pain right now. Um, recognize those withdrawal symptoms as important and meaningful and let them know that buprenorphine is um, available to um, treat all those symptoms. Um, I feel like I'm just downloading a ton of information to you guys. I appreciate your patience. Um, so one approach that we want to share is this youth acceptance approach. Meet them where they're at. Um, help them make choices in their life, understanding it might not be the choice that you'd want that for them right now, um, and kind of understand these intersectional uh, drug use issues, sex work issues, and other safety behaviors. Um, we really want to keep this young person alive so that they can keep making choices in their life. So we're teaching them about 
safer techniques if they choose to use drugs, how to do that in a way that will keep them alive. We're teaching them about ways like maybe you could use buprenorphine a couple days a week so that you don't have cravings while you're in school. You and I know that if they are able to do that, it will end up using less drugs on the weekends as well. But you know, get to where we can come up with an agreement or a plan that works for them and um, understand that buprenorphine does last a while, so it will protect their brain. Um, and of course, you and I want them to take their medications every day, but they might not be there yet, so get to a yes. Um, abstinence and stopping drugs altogether is rarely something that I'm talking about. System involved youth, um, so this is kids in the juvenile justice system, um, kids who are outside of home in the child welfare system. There's a couple different op opportunities to think about this. One is young people or even babies who are exposed to caregiver drug use and are separated from their families. There's kids who are pregnant and parenting themselves. Um, and then there's kin care, so young people who are cared for either formally or informally by relations, and this could be formally, it could be informally because of immigration issues. I've had, you know, kids being raised by mom and dad who then have to go to grandparents because mom and dad get deported. So there's a lot of things going on in our young person's life. And it's important to know exactly what's going on because the guardian to consent for buprenorphine will depend on sometimes these issues. So you would want to know if you have a guardian, um, you know, who is that guardian? Are you in the home? Are you out of the home? Um, so that we can make sure that we're doing all of our dotting our I's and crossing our T's. If somebody is in the foster care system, your doctor will need to submit a form, which I'm going to show you. It looks like this. It's a pretty easy form, actually. A lot of doctors have no idea that they need to do this, but this is what doctors need to do in order to start buprenorphine while somebody is with a guardian or foster care system. So this happens um, in my setting, and I know it happens in other places, and I think what ends up happening most often is that kids who are out of the home in the foster care system and the child welfare system are just not connected to care because everybody's like, well, the next person is going to write that form. I really want to help you help your doctors like submit this form while they're starting treatment. At the same time they're starting treatment, you write the prescription for medications, you give that patient medications, and you fill out this form. We will be able to have templates for our doctors to fill out the form, but it's really not that hard. Um, and it is not a reason to delay care. Or let me say that positively. If you happen to see a kid in the juvenile justice system, in the child welfare system, it's all the more important to start treatment. We also know a lot about naloxone. You've had a lot of talks about this. It does save lives. It reverses opioid overdose deaths. Young people can be prescribed naloxone, so they have it. They can be handed it to them from our community distribution programs. Um, there is absolutely no regulations preventing young people from having naloxone, from holding naloxone, from giving it to their friends as peer educators themselves. Um, and it's important that to kind of like the message that I've been repeating recently is any naloxone is better than no naloxone. So if you're not trained, if you know the grandma's gonna give naloxone but she's never used it before, she didn't really get educated, it's better that she tries it than not tries it. So um, I had a young person whose family revived him five times before we gave naloxone to him and his family by prescription, and we really started buprenorphine. And how scary for that family five times to see that person in that near death. Um, and the first time the mom said, like, I wasn't sure I did it right. I think I put it in their mouth and, you know, all the things. But I'm like, you did it right because he's here. And I, am you know, recognize that family trauma that's you know, a very scared family, they're scared for their loved one, and that's an opportunity for their loved one to start treatment so that they don't have that next event. I'm going to just pivot for a second because young people, I think, uniquely are in a place of economic hardship. It's hard for young people to get jobs that can sustain them independently and sustain their family if they have kids, and also um, less experience with healthy relationships. So it's it's more easy for young people to be involved with drugs and also be involved with um, issues requiring requiring our help around sexual health. So um, what does that mean? Clearly, it means if they're using meth, there's a lot of sex acts that happen. Maybe they wouldn't choose those sex acts, um, but they're feeling very aroused or um, they're able to be uh, coerced a little bit easily, whether that's completely consensual or not. It's a little hard to say, but we want to address that that issue with that youngster 
in a healthcare setting so that we can provide them you know, contraception if they need it, emergency contraception if they need it, help them understand if they're pregnant and get care if they need it, um, and also look into STDs, um, syphilis is on the rise, HIV is on the rise, um, all those things. So please um, be the person who helps co-address these issues. Um, transactional sex is real, whether that's, you know, my boyfriend's two decades older than me and I can sleep with him and have a safe place to live. Like that's a real thing that a lot of our youngsters are going through. Um, that's not, I was gonna say, that's not good or bad. Like it is bad, obviously. I wish everybody could make all these healthy choices that they wanna make, but I don't want to blame the youth for making a bad choice. That's what I mean by that. Um, so just recognize that there is pointed, you know, exploitation and child sex trafficking that kind of wants to get kids in a more um, malleable state by using drugs. I think that's less, explicitly common. Um, it can also happen in terms of child labor trafficking. So, you know, maybe you're 16 and working, you know, three jobs as a gardener in a restaurant and cleaning and you're taking meth in order to stay awake. And maybe that's like a choice that young person is making, but often it's in this whole set of like, you know, uh, trafficking either by an adult um, or by family members. So just keep, keep all these things aware in your mind. Um, when you have a young person who is at risk of pregnancy, you definitely want to help them make choices. And any 12-year-old or older can consent for these choices uh, without having their parents know. Both contraception and STD choices. So um, I want to put that out there, help your doctors do both of these things. The question that I ask my patient and my, my youth is, do you want to be pregnant this year? Maybe yes, like that's cool here's how we can help you have a healthy pregnancy. Um, no, maybe unsure. So a lot of unsures and a lot of maybes, I still provide all the options that they can for contraception, right? So emergency contraception, plan B or Ella, make sure they have that in their pocket. And all these other like pills, patches, Nexplanon, shots, IUDs, all the things, so that people can live the lives that they wanna live as least complicated as possible. That's a lot to digest. The next pillar to digest is this concept of young people who do use drugs also need to be um, helped understand their choices to use them as safely as possible. So of course we want everybody to make, you know, I'm never using drugs, I'm gonna go to the gym every day, I'm gonna be vegetarian, but like not everybody's there yet. They might be using drugs, they need to have tools in their pocket. Young people can have these tools too. They can definitely have fentanyl test strips, this helps them choose if they want to use a drug, definitely have Narcan, um, definitely should be encouraged to have this understanding of what I consider universal precautions. Just like when we were in COVID, you know, we all wore masks, even though we didn't all have COVID. So start these practices universally to help you stay safe with the drugs. Use a little bit of it, go slow, start with a small amount, see how they affect you, only gradually increase them. Know what the drugs are. You can have xylosine test strips, you have fentanyl test strips. You also have drug testing programs in some areas that will tell you exactly what it is. Oh, that's all baby powder. That's cocaine. That's not, you know, what is it? Avoid mixing drugs. So this is why I think I, some of our young people have challenges is they get drunk, then they use cocaine, then they use um, fentanyl, something like this. So they, it's like they start with one, then they mix in all these other in the salad. Um, try to have them just stay with one, have their brain, it and, and then, you know, make choices. Um, never use alone and the Brave app. These are two things to make sure that they have somebody with them. Young people tend to be using in a social setting where the friends are around, but, you, you know, then that person went off to the stairwell and they use something. So if you're going to be using drugs, use with a friend. If you're going to be using drugs alone, these are two strategies that will help that young person connect either online or by the phone to somebody who's like, are you there? Are you there? Are you there? And if they're not there, they will help activate a recovery system for them. Plan for opioid overdose. Like even though you're not intending to use opioids like fentanyl, they are present in our community and all the other drug supplies unintentionally. You need to be safe and have naloxone. There are also processes for people who are injecting drugs or smoking drugs to do those things safely. This can be an, an eye-opening experience to have a conversation with a young person about how do you inject your drugs safer, right? Because obviously I'm like, I'm a mom, I want none of my young people to be injecting any of the drugs. And 
I have to put that brain aside and be like, I'm here to meet this person where they're at so that they can be safe and be alive so that we can help them as long as possible. You can definitely teach young people how to use their drugs more safely um, and do that with your clinicians. So this is kind of tools that I'm talking to my young person about. Um, I am definitely helping them understand uh, not just opioids, but stimulants, right? What to do if somebody is overdosing on stimulants, your heart's going really fast, you um, have chest pain, things like this um, come into medical care there. It's not just opioids that people overdose from. Smoking safety, this is um, an area that I'm learning from my community a lot, how to keep their mouths safe, how to keep their bodies safe, how to make sure that pipe doesn't burst and cause burns all over their face or all in their, in their throat. Um, and these are tools for you to share with your patients. Um, smoking tools to help people stay safe depends on what kind of drugs they're smoking with. I did not know that before starting this job, but now I know a lot more and you guys probably know even more than I do and our community members know a lot as well. So I ask them to educate me how they're doing it and help identify areas um, that could be done more safer. These are tools and visual tools that have been developed in other areas that I steal from to help communicate with my patients. So this whole talk was maybe like feeling like way too many things all at once, but I want you to feel confident um, saying, hey, this young person has a problem and being able to tell a doctor your concerns. Like I'm advocating for my young person to get treatment because you now know that doctors what 53 times will not treat that patient and then one time out of 54 treat that patient you guys have to help us help our patients do better so that they stay alive we know we've been working work to keep them alive and we also know that we have to work on opioid overdose prevention even if you're not using opioids um, so we're promoting wellness and we're also talking about all these really critical things that happen when people use drugs relationships housing health sex family planning all that stuff um, I'm going to pause here. What questions do you guys have? You know, Rebecca, I have two people interested in xylosine testing. What can you comment about that? Xylosine is, for those who don't know, an adulterant that either intentional is unintentionally by most users and users, but intentionally by um, suppliers put in generally opioids to uh, have a cheaper way of extending a high. Um, it is, feels and looks like an opioid high, but it is not reversed by naloxone because it's not an opioid um, technically in the brain. So there's ways to test for it. They're just like these fentanyl test strips. They look identical, you know, different color, and um, people can test their drug supply. It is true that it is probably at least one set of drugs in your community has had xylosine in it in the past year. It is not super prevalent yet. Um, I'm anticipating in the next couple of years, this will be more and more prevalent in our communities. We know, I think in LA, we did some estimating based on um, testing local drug supply and we saw maybe a couple hundred drugs tested. We saw it pop up two, three, four times. So it's pretty low. Um, and um, it's important that people just are aware that it's out there. If it's happening in your community more often, you'd wanna have a more strong um, response to it. Um, definitely still continue to use naloxone if you see something that looks like an overdose event and get that person to medical care um, as they might not respond as well to the naloxone as they used to. Thank you, Rebecca. And um, somebody's asking about getting test strips for xylosine. I have not heard of that and I heard the ones they have are not are not reliable. Have you heard any more news about that, the xylosine yes. strips? Yes. I have, um, there were two sources of xylosine strips. The first ones that came out were less useful. The second ones that came out are more useful and I will forget the name of which one was which, but we just started purchasing from the more, you know, responsible one. And we can, um, when we send out these slides, we can put out information on that. Um, I do don't want to use this information to scare our community, right? It's still pretty very rare event way more important that people focus on things that they can do to save lives now, like have Narcan, talk to young people about treatment, all those things. And also just feel comfortable and confident if xylosine is popping up in those conversations. Okay, the best thing we can do for our community is get people into treatment, make sure there's access to buprenorphine and have people be able to test their drug supply so that it's a, a safer supply. 
Great. Thank you. Any other questions for, for Re Rebecca? We have her, her in the house. Few more minutes. She um, is always available to answer questions. If you want to email us at mentors at cabridge.org, we can always pass it along to her. Um, she's got a full time gig <laughs> besides us, but we are happy to have the short time that we do with you, Rebecca. That was amazing. Thank you so much for building our confidence. Thank you guys. I really, really appreciate all of this information. We hope it gives you more confidence, like she said, to talk to your doctors um, and even kind of experience the whole patient and parent um, situation. I know when I, I, before we started, I shared with Rebecca my you know, first time I, I as a navigator talking directly to the patient, you know, um, about substance use versus the parents and the parents got really upset with me because I didn't ask their permission and why was I introducing these questions so um right. definitely it might be the first time can I share it like it might be the first time that parent ever experienced when their kid is having this kind of problem but to you know you know, how many times you have to sign permission for field trips and now the kid's 13 and able to consent and it's going to be the first time that they um, have an experience where an adult is treating their child as capable and competent and legally um, responsible for making decisions. So just, you know, acknowledge that that's rough. We've all probably been in some parts of our life. So, hey, mom, dad, I love you. I'm so glad you're here for them. I, I can tell you really care. And also, this might be the first time, but your youngster has, um, you know, an important moment for them to step up and share with us some information, things like that. Great. Thank you so much again. And, you know, feel free. Um, Erica has her hand raised. Erica, can you unmute? I'm not sure if she can unmute or not. You want to type it in the chat? Okay. Yeah. Somebody's yeah. sharing that they had a 13 year old die yesterday from an overdose event. Um, that is that is real. We had um, a case in LA not so recent, like two weeks ago, where basically two kids of the same age, one had access to naloxone and was given it, and one didn't. And the youth um, who had naloxone survived. The youth that didn't have naloxone passed away from an opioid overdose event. So it is, you know, one of the saddest things that can happen in our community and opioid overdose, I want to say, is a completely preventable event. We should be thinking about this as something that should never happen. I know, and, and they keep continuing with another 16-year-old. We're so sorry for these losses, and it just shows how important our navigators and the distribution of naloxone to anybody who has school-age children um, to have a, a naloxone at home in their emergency kit, right? You have Tylenol, you have Band-Aids, and, and now we need to have naloxone. So lots of work to do. Thank you so much. I am going to pick this um, back up and give you, share some resources. So um, I know a lot of you struggle to find resources for um, community outreach for um for youth. And so right now, um, we want to pass on some YOR, the Youth Opioid Response Grantees. These are um, counties and organizations have, that ha are grantees of the YOR grant, and they are um, starting implementation projects. So we just wanted you to be aware. So that way, if you do come in contact with one of these organizations, you can let, uh, you can talk with them and ask them what is their um, implementation project. Um, so a lot of these organizations, and there's some counties that are involved, again, are um, getting grant money to start implementation projects. So they might be, um, you know, taking in uh, information. Sometimes they don't know what's going on in the community. So if you are in one of these service areas, please try to connect and ask um, ask these organizations, what are you doing um, for our youth in our area? What can you offer? Um, this is the second slide. And these are um, 
agencies that are, have building their building capacity. So not necessarily that they have are implementing a program, but they are um, receiving funds to perhaps um, build the capacity to take on youth. So it doesn't mean that they're necessarily take. Um, taking care of youth, but that they are building capacity. So it might look different in each organization. These are all of the different organizations. So again, you know, just reaching out to your community and saying, hey, you know, I heard you're a YOR grantee. What projects do you have for youth? And this is the last um, slide with other counties and um, other agencies. So we really, really did want to share that to make sure that you have resources. I also um, can leave it on here a little bit, minute more if you want to look. Um, also want to share Youth in Recovery. This is a great organization. They provide peer counseling, group counseling, local chapters, training and life skills. Remember Rebecca was saying about um, just having those, those uh, consistency and those habits for life, right? Waking up on time, things like that. Um, and wanted to remind you, all services are free of charge. So this is a great um, organization to um, add to your community outreach um, if you haven't already. Um, so these are the takeaways. You know, it's substance use disorder for youth is individualized work. And we just want to remind you, you are part of a hospital team. So don't feel like you're all alone. Also, follow the consent laws for minors um, and definitely, um, you know, work with your social worker, work with um, people that may have already experienced these um, consent laws. And then educate youth. I, that's one thing that's a take home for me is harm reduction practices. Um, again, anyone with school age children, middle school, high school, really should know what's going on in their community and fentanyl has hit an all time high in our areas and we are seeing overdose. Um, so really remember overdose uh, Overdose Awareness Day is coming, so I'm, we're gearing you up, you guys. You have a month to, to help your community. And then utilize community resources. There's plenty other um, organizations. We only gave you a small, um, a small snapshot, so please look into your own communities. Um, there's lots of different organizations. Um, with that being said, um, any other questions? Anything else we can help you? Okay. Um, to end, we're going to end a, a minute or two early, um, but just wanted to let you know we have a California Bridge Academy, and that is on our website, and your access to over, I think, 16 trainings, so if you're new, I saw a lot of new, of, new um, navigators, and welcome to your first training, but we have plenty more on our CA Bridge Academy, and it's completely free. You get CEUs, you get a certificate of attendance, so we strongly urge you to go onto the website and sign up. Again, all training is free. You can contact us. We try to keep just one email, mentors at cabridge.org. That does go to our whole mentor team. Um, so you will get a response. And speaking of, these are your mentors. So if you haven't gotten contact with one, please, mentors at cabridge.org. We will pair you up with somebody um, who is experienced and has started their program. These are wonderful mentors and they cover all of California. Um, so please let us know if you need to reach out. And this is me with that. Any other questions? All right, you guys, we are so happy that you could join us. And again, mentors at cabridge.org if you have any questions. I will stay on a few more minutes in case you do have a meeting or any questions. Will you receive a recording link? Yes, we will. Yes, absolutely. And the post event email will be sent shortly. Anything else? Well, thank you guys for coming. As usual, we action pack all of the information. And if there's a question you do did not uh, weren't able to tell us, please mentors at cabridge.org. We are always available. And um, for some of you um, that are interested in our CHW certification update, um, we will have that at two o'clock. We will put that um, link in the chat. 
Um, for those that you that want to get an update, it's what we know so far. Again, there's still things developing, but if you want to hear just the latest and greatest, um, if we can put that in the chat, we will in just a second. And there it is. Chaya just put it down. You can join. No need to register. You just click on that link and you will be um, with us at two o'clock. All right, guys. 